All right, well, let's uh, get started. So welcome back. Um, so today, I guess we have somewhat fewer people in person attending than usual because of an online career day. Uh, so uh, we'll see what happens to our breakout. Perhaps we'll just have the breakout discussion right here. Um, but um, anyway, uh, uh, the paper we're going to talk about today is all about how do you find concurrency bugs? So if you remember, Last time we talked about the shared memory model that uh, multiprocessor computers have for us, like x86 TSO, and that seemed fairly tricky uh, to reason about. Um, so today's paper uh, is looking at the problem of how do you actually find bugs due to concurrency. And this paper isn't really even about weak memory models. This is, as far as I can tell, concurrency bugs with even a sequentially consistent memory model. Um, the reason this turns out to be a big deal and why we're spending quite a number of lectures on this is because concurrency bugs are really quite subtle and difficult to find in practice. Um, and uh, the other problem is that in addition to being subtle, they're actually quite hard to find with testing. And there's basically two things going on with testing that make it difficult to uh, uh, find concurrency bugs. The first is um, you can think of it as coverage. So you want to test all the possible concurrency scenarios that your code might exhibit and make sure that no bugs can be triggered. But actually getting high coverage for concurrency is effectively impossible because there are so many different ways that your code could run if it has many threads that are interleaving with one another in shared memory. So coverage is one problem. Um, the other is actually reproducibility. So if you hit a bug in some execution, it might be actually quite difficult for you to figure out what went wrong because you might not be able to get the same exact interleaving of threads if you run the code again on your computer. So that ends up being another problem for why um, concurrency bugs are actually quite difficult to deal with in regular testing. And the core challenge, uh, if you will, for why concurrency bugs are so difficult to find really has to do with interleavings. And here I mean interleavings of different threads that are executing uh, your application. So one way to maybe pick, uh, visually think of this is we have a couple of threads running along here. Here they are running sort of top to bottom. And these threads have different opcodes, A, B, C, you know, D, E, F, X, Y, Z. And the question is, what will our computer run these threads as? Uh, in what order will it run these operations? So these operations are running on multiple cores and we pretend like we have a nice sequentially consistent memory model. You can think of the computer running, you know, some operation from one thread, like maybe it starts with A. So let me draw out a possible execution. Then we'll start with A, then we run B, but then we switch to running another thread. Maybe then we jump to D and run E, and then we jump to this thread. So this corresponds to running A, B, then we run D, E, then we run X and Y. Then we might, yeah, maybe finish this thread, go back, finish this guy, go back, finish that. So that corresponds to X, Y, Z, then F, then C. That's just one interleaving of these threads. And you can imagine there's many others, right? So you could imagine another interleaving where you run this, and then this, and then this. That's an interleaving where all the threads run um, to completion effectively, A, B, C, D, E, F, X, Y, Z. All these interleavings are actually quite different executions of the code and might or might not trigger bugs depending on which interleaving you choose. And exploring these interleavings and figuring out if any one of them has a problem is sort of the root cause of why it's difficult to get high coverage and reproducibility in a sense. Uh, for concurrency bugs. Does that make sense? That's the core problem we're struggling with in this TSVD system. And the sort of, there's two cool things going on in a TSVD. Um, so one is that um, one reason why we're uh, sort of looking at this paper is that it's actually a pretty effective tool. So despite this problem being kind of intractable at a general scale, uh, like fully solving this seems uh, quite out of reach of current techniques, uh, but TSVD actually makes some credible progress and seems to be perfectly usable as a tool. 
has, you know, partially finds some, some bugs for you, doesn't find every bug, um, but it's pretty useful for developers. Um, so that seems pretty cool. So uh, interesting to read about this tool and understand what makes it work well. Um, another reason is that it actually has some actually uh, interesting ideas or techniques uh, that are worth uh, discussing for how to actually uh, find bugs. And um, one sort of other thing going on here is that we're using this paper sort of as, a, as an excuse to, find, to talk about different ways you might go about finding bugs in concurrent software, not just TSVD in particular. So the first half of this lecture is actually going to be sort of a, de a description of all the different ways you might go about finding bugs in concurrent software that are maybe not quite TSVD and what the landscape looks like um, for these tools. Make sense? Any questions so far? All right. So one thing you might wonder about is uh, TSVD takes uh, the testing approach, meaning that you're actually going to run the code and try to see if you can hit a bug in your test execution. And then you'll see, OK, well, we found a bug. An alternative approach you might think about is actually static analysis. So one uh, reason why static analysis might be an appealing plan for dealing with concurrency bugs is sort of the same reason why we said static analysis was cool in the Google and Facebook paper, meaning that you don't actually have to produce an execution that triggers the bug. You can just look at the code and say, there's probably a bug here. And given that we have such a hard time reasoning about all the executions shown on the right side of the slide, maybe static analysis would be a cool way to go because then we don't have to go for all these executions. Unfortunately, static analysis doesn't really work out super well uh, in the context that uh, these guys are thinking about it, meaning using static analysis to find concurrency bugs in existing software is not really viable. And the reason it's not really viable is that uh, these kinds of um, thread safety or sort of concurrency bugs are often non-local. What I mean by this is that you can't just look at a single function and say that there's a concurrency bug here. You really have to understand in what context is that function going to get called. So, for example, is the caller of that function holding a lock, or is the caller of that function really sure that no one else is going to have a concurrent operation on the same object or data structure? So, this non-locality makes it quite difficult to run scalable analyses, which is what the Google and Facebook papers were all sort of arguing for for performance, uh, and in particular. Uh, Typically, these kinds of uh, concurrent software analyses really have to be interprocedural. Um, this is something that uh, the Facebook paper, if you recall, talked about a lot. They were actually able to achieve this. And in order to do interprocedural analyses, you have to really summarize what is a function doing. And here we have to summarize the function's behavior with respect to concurrent software, which is actually quite tricky. So we need some kind of a spec for a function that describes how it runs with respect to other concurrent threads. And in the Facebook paper, those guys in the infer tool figured out a very cool technique for automatically inferring specs for functions for reasoning about memory safety. But it's actually hard to infer these things for concurrency. Um, And this is sort of the reason why static analysis doesn't really work out uh, in the sense of automating uh, analyses of large code bases. Now, in subsequent lectures, we're going to talk about how to formally reason about concurrency. And you can think of that as a very fancy form of static analysis. But really, the games there are much more involved. So the developer is much more involved in writing these specifications and reasoning about individual functions. And it's far from being a tool you can just throw at a bunch of existing code and hope to get some meaningful results out. So that's sort of the context. So static analysis uh, is quite difficult to apply for concurrent bugs uh, because of the known locality that we see in all the interleavings here. Um, so the alternative really is runtime testing. Runtime testing. And the reason this is much more tractable is that uh, we don't need to find specs for functions. We don't need to have some complicated analysis. We just run the code. And at a very top level, there's two things you got to figure out if you want to do runtime testing for anything, but for concurrency bugs in particular. Uh, so first, you got to define what is a bug. So what are you looking for when you're running the code? Uh, 
so that when a bug occurs, you know that it happened other, <laughs> rather than you keep running and you don't even notice that you hit a bug. So that seems like the first thing you got to do. And the second thing you got to do is figure out how are you going to explore schedules? So schedules uh, are sort of these interleavings that I talked about up here. Um, that's sort of the core non-determinism that we are struggling with. And if we want to find bugs that might manifest when we run the software later on some customer machine or in production, well, we got to sort of guess, well, what are all the possible ways the threads could be interleaved later when they run on a customer or production workload? And we got to try to get something similar in our test so that we can hit a bug if there's a bug there to be found. Uh, so there's uh, different approaches we'll look at for how do you explore schedules and uh, how do you try to push the threads around to consider different interleavings. So at the end of the day, we are going to try to consider some set of interleavings like I showed up here and see which ones trigger a bug. Um, and then to define a bug, there's uh, you know, not a whole lot of new stuff going on here. So there's the usual rules. Uh, so for example, you could define the bug as being the wrong result of your application. And this is a very end-to-end -end definition, uh, but it's probably the most difficult to pull off because it's very application specific and requires you to actually specify what is the correct or an incorrect result. Um, and then there's various weaker forms. So um, you, know, you might define that a crash is a bug. So if your program dereferences a null pointer or throws some kind of an exception, that's a bug. And that seems pretty likely to be a bug as well. Um, and then there's other forms that you might uh, think about that are not sort of you know, going down this list almost. We are um, going further away from end-to-end -end definitions of what is a bug. Ultimately, it's wrong results, crashes, probably bad, uh, some kind of an invariant violation uh, that's internal to your software. Uh, might be better for bug finding, but maybe not as end-to-end -end of a definition of what is a bug. So we'll talk about these different strategies uh, in a bit. All right, any questions so far? Runtime testing, that's what we're gonna try to look at. Cool, all right. So let's look at some straw man uh, schemes just to get our feet wet with this uh, plan. So, um, you know, straw man one, is, uh, you know, just run stuff many times. So one way to think of it is that we have some piece of software, we have those threads, like we had earlier, A, B, C, and then we have D, E, and F. Well, we'll just run this a couple of times on our computer. And the hope is that every time we run, maybe we'll get a slightly different schedule. So maybe the first time we run, our operating system does something like this, and then jumps over here and then goes back and finishes C. That's one execution. So we'll get you know A, B, D, E, F, and then C. And then we run again. And you know, there's something here that happened that caused the scheduler to jump from the first thread to the second. Maybe it doesn't happen the second time around. And the schedule we get instead is more like this. And the pink guy is A, B, C, D, E, F. So that's sort of the hope underlying this uh, repeated run strategy. Um, and the one sort of thing that people tend to do to make this repeated run strategy more interesting is to scale up the number of threads. So instead of just having two threads, they create lots and lots of threads. So you might have, I don't know, create hundreds or thousands of threads for all I care. And the advantage of that is that having more threads perhaps gives the scheduler more room to choose non-deterministically and to trigger various subtle corner cases or race conditions. Um, so maybe the prominent example of this strategy to run many times is actually in the Linux kernel. So Linux kernel um, has these uh, modes that are called uh, the, the, the lock torture test, uh, which sort of tortures the lock subsystem. And there's a fancy uh, lock-free algorithm in the Linux kernel called RCU and there's also an RCU torture test in Linux. Uh, and bo both these tests are pretty widely used by Linux developers to find bugs. And uh, they think that these are important tests. And they basically are of this shape, where you just run, you create lots and lots of threads, and you run many times or for a long time, and you hope to hit some kind of a bug. And they have some application-specific definition of what a bug is, like we were talking on a previous slide. You got to define what you're looking for in a test. So this works. 
well enough that uh, some applications like Linux really push this quite a bit. Um, but there's really two downsides. So one is that it's really hard to explore different schedules. What I mean by this is that um, your test harness, like your torture test, or you create a hundred threads, you know, it's not going to explore every possible schedule. There's some bias or something going on in the schedule that's probably going to pick the same family of schedules over and over. And maybe if you run on a customer machine or a machine with twice the number of CPUs, maybe all of a sudden something very different is going to happen. Um, so it's hard to really explore differences that your particular machine just isn't going to schedule for you. So that's one bummer for this rerunning plan. Um, another bummer is actually it's the reproduction problem. Um, so if you find a bug, uh, it might be actually quite difficult to figure out what went wrong. Uh, if the bug itself is a crash, you know, something went wrong, you'd reference the null pointer. Well, why is there an null pointer here? That might be a hard question for you to answer. And you'd have to go back and figure out, well, what schedule did they pick? And because you just ran a whole bunch of them, you might not even know which schedule caused you to get an null pointer. Uh, so that's this uh, sort of straw man approach of running many times. It's real, uh, but uh, has some problems in coverage for the most part. Make sense? All right, so a different approach you might think about in this space is uh, something I might call exhaustive or some kind of a very methodical plan to explore schedules. Uh, so again, we might have our multiple threads over here, A, B, C, and then we got D, E, F over here, and then maybe another thread that does X, Y, and Z. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna just consider all the possible things we could run. So, you know, we're starting out, we might run A, or we might run D, or we might run X. What this corresponds to is that we have three threads that haven't really started running, so we could start any one of them. Once we start one of them, we could continue the same guy, or we could switch to a different thread. So this, this path sort of indicates, well, we've run A, and now the question is, do we keep running the same first thread, and we go to B, or do we go to a different thread, like D or X? And all these paths have a possibility. Uh, there's a lot of different interleavings. This is the huge space we were talking about before, but at least in principle, uh, we can explore different schedules. So sort of the, good, the good plan, uh, the good part of this plan is that it's uh, you know, maybe high coverage. Um, the bad, of course, is that uh, not really practical uh, in the naive form uh, because there's just too many of these schedules. And in addition to there being too many of these schedules, uh, many of them are probably too similar. So it wouldn't necessarily be a problem that you know, we have uh, a million schedules that we checked, because that's sort of maybe the best we could hope for. We only have time to run a million tests, fine. But you got to really pick a million tests that are interestingly different, so that you might hit different bugs in these million tests. But if you do this very methodical exploration of all the ways you could interleave the threads, it's very easy to get stuck enumerating boring combinations of the same stuff over and over. And you never really get to try in some other way of interleaving stuff that causes a bug to be hit. That makes sense? Questions about this exhaustive style of uh, bug finding techniques? I should say one nice thing about this uh, plan is that it's actually very repeatable. So uh, because we are making the schedule an explicit choice for us, we can remember what schedule caused us to get to a certain point. So if we, get, if we hit a bug, we know what happened. Um, that's very uh, useful to know. All right. So I should say that uh, these uh, straw men, uh, you know, even though they're straw man designs, they are indeed used for real. So Linux kernel used this first one quite a bit uh, and other applications use it as well. Um, this exhaustive plan um, is actually, there's quite a bit of research uh, uh, on this exhaustive plan. And uh, I don't mean exhaustive in the sense that this research imagines that you're gonna really try every combination, but uh, there's quite a bit of projects that look at the possibility, uh, the, trying to explicitly reason about which uh, interleaving you want to choose. 
And the paper we read about for today, TSVD, is definitely not in this category. It's not trying to reason about all these interleavings directly. Um, but it's worth uh, sort of trying to maybe summarize. Um, lecture notes have some pointers if, you, if you're curious to these other papers and research directions on um, explicitly enumerating uh, interleavings and choosing them. Um, but sort of one uh, big idea that came out from this line of work an explicit uh, exhaustive schedule enumeration is the importance of choosing the right preemption points. So what I mean by this is that um, in the enumeration that we considered up here on the top of the slide, we were just thinking, well, I got a bunch of instructions here and a bunch of instructions there, and every thread has a bunch of instructions. And we'll just choose one instruction at a time. And it turns out that interleaving most instructions turns out to be kind of boring in the sense that uh, you're not going to find interesting bugs. And instead, there are some points in the code where preemption really matters. Uh, so sort of basically, some places where it's not worth trying to switch to another thread because you're unlikely to find a new bug this way. Uh, but other places are really good candidates for finding bugs. So for example, if you're just about to acquire a lock, well, maybe that's a great place for you to try to switch somewhere else because then the order will really matter and do something different. Or if you're, you know, doing some kind of a shared memory access. If you're doing some operation on shared memory, well, that really sounds like you might actually do something very different if you ran before or after another thread that does a similar shared memory access. Um, so, uh, important insight to keep in mind is that if you really want to find concurrency bugs, it's important for you to figure out what are profitable places to try to switch between running from one thread to another. Another sort of interesting uh, point uh, that sort of empirically turns out to be the case is that often actually relatively few preemptions are needed. So by preemption, I mean a switch from one thread to another. Uh, so many bugs for concurrency can be shown by just preempting at the right points a couple of times, maybe like once or twice or maybe three times. That's going to be enough to find a whole bunch of concurrency bugs uh, because many of these bugs can be triggered by sort of just having the wrong thread jump in at the wrong time and corrupt something for you, as opposed to, you know, you need 20 threads to be involved and uh, switch at exactly the right points. Maybe there's other bugs there too, but uh, it's certainly sufficient to uh, have a few preemptions to find bugs in, in, in practice. Um, another sort of important lesson from this line of work that I want to maybe summarize for you guys is that there's lots of optimizations that uh, uh, people do to avoid equivalent schedules. So as we were looking at here, uh, we were considering, you know, should we run A first or, and then D, or should we run D and then A perhaps? Uh, and it might be the case that even though we thought these were profitable preemption points, maybe in that particular case, preempting these operations doesn't actually give us a different execution. Um, so all of work in this research space has gone into trying to figure out how to decide ahead of time that it's actually not worth trying different orders of certain operations because we know because of some semantics of locks, for example, that it's actually not going to result in a different outcome, even though it's a different schedule. So that's sort of this line of work on uh, very explicit schedule exploration. And uh, quite an interesting set of papers, but uh, ends up being kind of difficult to run in practice, in part because you need very explicit control of the scheduler. So you need to make the decision as to what thread to run. And um, a very, uh, that turns out to be difficult to do in large systems where you would have to sort of lift up the entire world and replace the underlying platform on which the software is running with your own implementation that has explicit scheduling control. So that's sort of the reason why this is maybe not as popular, although maybe an interesting thought experiment for what you would do uh, and maybe effective for smaller scale uh, pieces of software. Make sense? Questions about these uh, sort of more explicit approaches. This is maybe as more of a contrast to what we're going to talk about in this paper, which is TSVD. All right, so that's sort of the one set of straw men that we talked about, and a rather different approach um, that uh, TSVD takes and uh, other tools 
is really look at concurrency invariance. And it's a little bit of a weird contrast at first because I was talking about how do you explore schedules and now I'm switching to talking about how do you find define bugs instead. So the previous straw mans were all about how to explore the schedules and then you know we were going to define bugs and maybe crashing or something stands on like this. But the reason we're going to talk about concurrency invariance as almost a counterpart to schedule exploration is because uh, you can think of you know your your actual execution as going along on some trajectory and this is the you know interleave trajectory we were talking about before a b d e f c whatever order of thread operations we were looking at on previous slides and eventually your software is probably going to crash if there's a bug there hopefully we'll find the bug we'll declare a crash okay we found a bug great the insight in this sort of alternative approach of thinking about concurrency invariance really stems from the fact that something has gone wrong far before the crash in particular we can talk about some intermediate point here where some kind of an invariant was violated and we'll talk about these invariants in a second but roughly speaking if we can find a good rule that software needs to follow to avoid concurrency bugs then we can check for that rule directly instead of waiting for that rule to be violated and then waiting for there to be a crash because of the violation there's sort of two reasons why this is actually a pretty profitable plan. Uh, one is that you can detect the bug earlier, so you can only uh, you only need to run for sort of this long until the invariant is violated, instead of having to run all the way to the crash point, so a shorter execution to find a bug. Another thing going on is that there's many different executions even after you've violated this invariant, so maybe there's you know, maybe there, maybe it's possible that you'll crash, or maybe actually you'll somehow got lucky and execute in a way that nonetheless doesn't demonstrate a crash or a problem. So the fact that you violated an invariant might be indicative that there's a bug, but you might not notice it because perhaps there's ways to finish executing without triggering the bug uh, that all that sort of went wrong at this invariant. This is a very high level picture trying to get you some intuition about uh, what's the difference between looking for these end to end bugs like crashes versus violating some intermediate invariant. Uh, but in particular, for uh, reasoning about concurrency bugs, this turns out to be quite profitable uh, because you can, you really need to reason about many fewer runs. Uh, so you don't need to reason about all these sort of three runs on the right side of the invariant violation. You just need to reason about the runs that will get you to the invariant violating point. So the really cool stuff is that fewer runs, uh, maybe to trigger the bug, uh, and perhaps even one run, maybe all the cases when you run, you'll violate an invariant, and then you don't actually have to explore all the schedules. That'd be ideal for us, and that's almost what TSVD is aiming for. Um, another sort of uh, cool thing is that uh, you don't actually need an exact race. That's maybe related to this fewer runs, property, uh, sorry, for exact uh, race. Um, what I mean by this is that uh, maybe there are some race condition here in our execution that caused the crash to happen, but this race, you know, almost happened, but didn't happen on this okay path. Well, we don't have to find this squiggly race condition here to prove that there is a bug as long as we do this invariant plan. That makes sense at a high level? This is sort of the family of approaches that uh, TSVD is really looking at. Uh, they're not looking at sort of an end-to-end -end, uh, bug, but really this uh, invariant of some sort. Uh, and it's kind of a cool property, but uh, you know, of course, has some downsides, meaning that you, you know you might have a false positive. Uh, so if your invariant is too strong, then uh, maybe there is no crash. Maybe this doesn't exist. Maybe you violated some invariant, but actually that's okay. You'll never crash. Um, so that would be uh, a, an annoyance uh, of this tool that developers would probably complain about. Um, so to give you some sense of what these invariants are uh, in, in practice, so maybe the simplest kind of an invariant um, for concurrency is uh, lock sets. So this lock set uh, idea is sort of exemplified by this cool paper on eraser that's uh, probably about 20 years old at this point. 
um, but uh, very effective and uh, impactful sort of piece of work. Uh, the idea sort of the, or the invariant that Eraser tries to maintain is that um, you know for any shared memory location. So imagine a piece of memory that multiple threads access. Well, if that exists, then any access uh, must be accessed while holding some lock. So the rule is whenever you touch a piece of shared memory, there's going to be the same lock somewhere being held protecting that access. So the reason this invariant is typically called lock sets is the way you typically check for it is that while you're running, uh, you're monitoring the execution. Every time there's an access to a shared piece of memory, you record what are the locks currently being held. And every time you access uh, the same piece of memory, you report more and more lock sets being held at those access points. And if the intersection of all those lock sets ever becomes empty, well, now you might be in trouble because there might not be a single lock protecting that memory location anymore. Simple invariant, true for you know, some simple software, uh, maybe a little bit too aggressive for more complicated things. So this uh, lock set business probably a little bit you know, too much on the false positive side. Uh, so maybe it wouldn't get used in practice for that reason, uh, because for complex data structures or complex sort of arrangements of threads, uh, maybe things are safe, even though there isn't a single lock for other reasons. Does that make sense? Questions about, so the style of thinking about concurrency bugs? All right, um, so another uh, important invariant to think about is uh, what uh, people often call as uh, data races. So the invariant here, um, uh, more often showing up in sort of language semantics than uh, actual tools that check for directly, uh, is that any, um, I guess the maybe the, the sort of positive way to think of it is that um, no, you can never have concurrent reads and writes to the same address. And here I mean that uh, if, if you have multiple threads accessing the same memory location at the same time, well, they better all be reading. If one of them is writing, then we're in trouble. If one of them is writing and another one is reading, then maybe the result, you could get either thing now, that's a race. Or if multiple guys are writing, then it's actually not clear who's going to win. Either one could actually be the result that gets written because they're running concurrently. And it's not deterministic which one will actually succeed in the end. Um, so this is an invariant uh, that you might posit your software should have. Like you should never have two threads at the same time reading and writing the same memory location. So this is a sort of a maybe good thought experiment for defining what is a, a bad thing to happen. Uh, but typically the way this uh, invariant manifests itself in tools that check for concurrency bugs um, is really through a sort of bigger invariant. Um, uh, it's usually called uh, happens before uh, checkers or happens before checking. And the reason, um, the reason this data race thing doesn't get checked directly is because it's extremely finicky to timing of thread operations. So if you have two threads that are literally about to run two instructions, one of which is reading and one of which is writing the same memory location, well, okay, we can flag a bug. But if one thread is just like one instruction off and it's like it's about to read that location, but it's not quite, another thread just wrote it, well, it's still a bug, but we just got a little bit unlucky or a little bit lucky, whichever way you want to think about it, we didn't quite hit this bug constraint. So in order to make this data race definition of a bug a little bit more pragmatic, uh, people have cooked up a way of thinking about when is this data race really a data race? That's more general than just the exact instant instruction we're about to run is conflicting. And the plan here is basically, instead of thinking about what is exactly racing at any given time, you can track 
uh, dependencies between threads. And these dependencies uh, are typically called happens before in this uh, sort of circle of literature. Um, and uh, these dependencies describe whether one thread is necessarily running before or after some other thread uh, already ran or will run. So the insight here is that when we have two threads accessing the same memory location, they might not be accessing at the same time. But the question we want to answer is, could they be accessing at the same time? And if we track these dependencies carefully enough, then what we can say is that if there is no dependency between the threads in either direction, meaning that thread one wrote to this location first, and then later thread two wrote to this location, but we didn't notice any dependency between thread one and two, then we can conclude that, well, in a different universe or a different world or a different execution, we could have gotten these guys lined up exactly right. So they really race at the same instant, and that's a data race. So if we have a precise tracking of all dependencies, then if we don't see a dependency, then it really is true. We could have shifted around our execution of threads to get them to race. Um, this is a pretty cool idea, very appealing. Uh, there's a number of tools that actually work this way. And I guess I should say maybe the invariant now is that instead of no concurrent reads and writes to the same address, it must be no unordered writes, reads and writes to the same address. And just to remind you of this unordered business, if we track all the dependencies right, then if two threads are unordered with respect to each other, if they lack a dependency between each other, then that means that they could have been concurrent so we can almost think, well, if they're unordered here, we could construct a different execution where we go back to this definition and we hit a race. Um, so that's the insight here. Uh, a bunch of tools actually work this way. So for example, in Go, Golang, if you run go test dash race, this is actually what happens. Uh, if you run that on your command line, uh, Go actually implements a form of uh, happens before tracking. And the Clang also has a tool called uh, Thread Sanitizer that also implements happens before tracking and tries to find these kinds of data race bugs. Uh, and there's other tools as well. You can look at the lecture notes for some pointers. So this is pretty cool. Uh, one reason why this invariant might be a better invariant than this lock set business up here is that it's actually more general. It's not just about locks, but maybe there's other synchronization plans that your software uses. like. You create a variable, then you send a message over a pipe, or you create a thread afterwards, or even like you open a TCP connection to yourself and you send a message over a TCP connection. All these might be ways in which your software ensures that you don't race on the same object. And if your tracking of dependencies is good enough, then uh, this will work pretty well. And you know, many tools use it because it does actually empirically work reasonably well in some situations. Um, the downside, of course, is uh, that even with happens before checking, you might have false positives. So this is sort of the main downside of this invariant based approach. And the false positive in the happens before case really is not so much that the model is wrong. Like happens before seems like a totally great way of thinking about this world. It's just happens before is hard to implement uh, precisely. And what it means is that uh, there might be dependencies in your software that your happens before analysis tool doesn't really understand. It thinks that everything is uh, unordered, but actually you did something clever, like you opened the network connection to yourself and sent a message. And because of that, you're totally fine, but the tool doesn't know that TCP connections are a, a kind of a happens before relationship. And then it might, uh, flag a bug that actually you don't care about because it can't really happen. Um, so that's sort of the downside of these tools is that maybe they're too complicated for sophisticated software uh, to get right for all the ways you might be controlling concurrency. So does that make sense? This is a different approach you might think about for finding concurrency bugs that revolves around trying to flag these issues earlier on in your execution by stating some invariants that 
or sorry, maybe more general than an exact race. And hopefully these invariants imply the existence of a crash that will happen later. So it's okay to flag the invariant violation instead of waiting for the eventual problem to arise. Questions about this stuff? Those are sort of the family of tools in which TSVD sits, the, the, the paper that we actually read about. Um, all right. So if there's no questions, I guess let's uh, start talking about uh, TSVD, the specific tool that uh, we read a paper about for today. And uh, here I wanted to actually discuss with you guys uh, so what, what's going on. How does TSVD fit into this landscape that I tried to lay out? Uh, and in particular, um, you know, what is a bug for them precisely? So they talk about these TSVs. Uh, so where do these come from? Who defines? where these TSVs arise and, and so on. And actually, could we have uh, false positives uh, in TSVD or could we actually have missed bugs? Um, so I guess that's the, roughly the, break, the, the question we asked you guys to think about for the paper. And uh, now uh, we should do a breakout room thing. And uh, you guys have 10 minutes roughly to chat about this stuff. Um, so any questions before we jump in? All right, if there's no questions, um, actually we ended up because of this career fair thing with uh, I think basically one breakout room worth of students attending anyway. So uh, we can actually go ahead, uh, I'll, I'll stop lecturing and you guys can chat about for 10 minutes uh, what you think is going on um, with this TSVD uh, bug definition. Uh, and then I'll sort of you know watch for 10 minutes and then uh, get you guys to sort of maybe we'll try to synthesize what, what, what we thought was right or wrong here. All right, so if there's no more questions, feel free to, okay, you guys, you can go ahead, chat about what's going on in TSCD. So I guess uh, at a high level, the only thing that uh, TCD will really find when it's looking for bugs is violations of those uh, invariants, uh, those thread safety invariants. So, if there's a concurrency bug that isn't captured by one of those, it certainly wouldn't be able to find it because it isn't looking for it. Uh, it just, I guess, out of the scope of it. Uh, so that's one broad class, I guess. Uh, and yeah, I guess, uh, I guess Nikolai had already said this, but if the invariants are too strong uh, and they're not really necessary for the code to be correct, then it'll flag something as a bug when it really shouldn't, for, when it isn't a bug and there is no possible buggy execution you know, because the invariant wasn't actually necessary or you know, didn't need to be as strong as it was. Um, because that's the yeah. bug then, right? That's a bug in the invariant. Well, I guess it's not a bug. I guess I wouldn't think of it as a bug in the invariant because the invariant is still correct in the sense that if the invariant is met, the code will be correct. But that doesn't mean that the code will be incorrect if the invariant is broken, which is sort of what they'd like to know. So it's like the contrapositive doesn't necessarily have to hold, I guess. That's a weird way to think of invariants. Not that I'm complaining, but uh, like by that definition, the invariant false is a perfectly great invariant. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Well, I guess, yeah, part of the invariant is that it should be true, that, that you should be able to prove it, I guess. And then the invariant is, yeah, interesting. I guess there's like two parts to the invariant. There's the one part that the user has to look at and make sure they maintain this invariant. And then what you'd like to know for it to be useful is that if that's maintained, then the, the library will actually do what it's supposed to do correctly or, or something like that. It's so I guess the false will, yeah, sorry. It's kind of like in concert where if you just uh, fail to compile anything, you, technically you still have like a sound compiler. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so anyone else, Christian or Jenny, I don't know if you guys are around, do uh, you have any thoughts on, so, so what, what's, where, did, where, where does this thing actually in TSD come from? So they, they have this uh, notion of, I guess, conflicting operations on some data structures. How do they know that some operations are conflicting? Uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, okay, so yeah, they call these uh, threat, uh, threat safety violations and uh, 
from what I've read, it seems that uh, the objects have a, a, a given like thread safety contract and then they do, uh, and whenever this contract is violated, uh, yeah, they, they trigger like this errors, for example, and these contracts can be different for different like data structures. Uh, and, yeah. and in general, uh, in the overall picture, it seems that they also use some like heuristics to find places where this could possibly happen. And they, for example, um, they do this thing called, uh, what's this? Uh, near miss. Uh, uh, they, they, they look for places where code, uh, for example, if we have like code executions or operations that are very close, uh, it's likely that we can find an error or, yeah, it's more likely to find an error than if we had like two operations that are really far away, uh, like um, something like that. Um, and yeah, uh, also they claim to uh, not have false positives and that's because uh, uh, everything, they, uh, they always check for trade threat safety violation anyway. So if it doesn't violate the contract, it's still fine. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess to add on to that, I guess, what you're saying is that uh, it's if it says that something is a bug, it certainly is a violation of the threat safety invariant because they have that trap mechanism that it'll check whether there is uh, currently an ongoing operation that uh, shouldn't be happening at the same time. So if it says there is one, then there definitely was one because it literally was one that they just paused or, or I guess delayed. Uh, so I don't think it should ever erroneously say that it's possible to have an invariant violation, I guess. I think an interesting separate question is whether every invariant violation is a real bug that someone should care about. I don't so. even know that these invariant thingies are right. Exactly, yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, when it comes to doing a read and a write to a memory location, we know exactly what it is that might go wrong. But these are operations on abstract, on data abstractions of some kind. Where did they get the idea how do they even know that one of them is a, is a read-only operation and one of them involves writes? Yeah, I guess I mean, that's the biggest question because when I listened to this paper at SOSD last year, this question puzzled me for about 15 minutes. And they don't say anything much about it. You were going to say something, Upamanya? Yeah, I was just going to say, I guess it seems like whoever writes the, uh, yeah, I guess the, the library that they're using, they simply, since they're the implementers of whatever data structure they're using, they think hard and figure out what those invariants should be, and hopefully they got it right. And I, as far as I can think, uh, that seems to be all you can say about it for, for TSED's story. I'm not sure if there's more, more than that going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, I, I think you know, basically the like most of the stories. Well, let, let, let me sort of you know start drawing some stuff again, and uh, we'll try to uh, dig into this maybe a little bit more detail uh, if we can. Um, so I think the indeed. So, so the, the, they have this like the, the, they basically have defined their own invariant. It's the TSV invariant or threat safety vari violation. Um, and what this is, it's really um, just like for concreteness. These guys are all about C sharp. And they like C sharp data structures, uh, and uh, they are really thinking about um, all the various methods you might call in these data structures. So these data structures, you know, there's a kind of a map in C sharp called the dictionary. Uh, so that turns out to be a common source of bugs for them. There's lists, there's queues, there's arrays or array list, and so on. And um, as far as I can tell, they, they themselves go through and carefully annotate. They find the data structures they think are important or are likely to be involved in a race that matters. And uh, they uh, go ahead and actually split up the methods into two sets, uh, one of which they call the read set, 
Uh, so these are operations that are reading from the data structure and another operation called the, another set called the write set, which contains all the methods that you might invoke on in a data structure that modify the data structure itself or logically the contents of it. And the invariant um, that they have uh, is basically uh, very similar to this data race invariant that I described uh, uh, on the previous board. The invariant basically says that uh, if uh, there can be nothing concurrent with a write. So if you have something from the write set that is currently executing, you better not be running anything else. No writes, no other writes, no other reads at the same time. That would be disastrous. Uh, so that's roughly the invariant that these guys posit. And uh, there's actually a hard-coded list of these things. So actually, the cool thing about this paper, one, one cool thing is these guys have the source code on GitHub. So I went and checked it out. So I can actually pull up, I think, the list of uh, invariants they coded up. So if you guys can see my screen, uh, so it's actually a checkout of their repo. And they have a file called runtime config, which just lists out uh, these data structures and their read and write methods on these data structures. So uh, for example, here, you see the dictionary data structure. They have this thing called the thread safety group. So these are a bunch of methods on the same data structure uh, that uh, have read and write properties. So you can see that the first group here is a bunch of methods you might call on a dictionary, like adding an element, removing, clearing the whole guy, setting a particular item. Uh, I guess there's two variants of set. Uh, these are all marked as a write API. And the intuition is that they're all modifying the dictionary Dictionary, I think, probably behind the scenes is probably a hash table. That's what's going on. Uh, and uh, it would be bad for the hash table if you had to concurrently modify it from two different threads, because maybe you'd have to resize the hash table as a result of one or both operations. And it would be disastrous if one thread is resizing a hash table, like copying, allocating memory, freeing memory, while a different thread decides to go access the hash table at the same time. You might you know, corrupt the thing, get lose an item, get, I don't know, an exception thrown, who knows. And then there's a bunch of methods down here that are just reads. So getting an item, checking if a key is there, a value is there, trying to get a value. Uh, all these are methods you can call in dictionary as many times as you want concurrently at the same time, as long as there is no write. Um, so the assumption is that reads uh, don't actually change anything internally about the data structure. Um, or they don't change anything enough to cause a problem potentially. Uh, maybe there's counters involved, but those counters better be uh, thread safe for performance, for example, uh, performance counters. Um, but uh, anyway, the invariant is that totally fine to have concurrent read operations running. So does that make sense? So this is, I think, an example of what they are manually specifying or parameterizing uh, for their thread safety violation invariant is basically an explicit list of things that are okay or not okay to run at the same time. A couple of uh, things that yeah, I think are interesting about this. Uh -huh. one, of the, one of them is you can't make this read-write decision based on, the, uh, based on the spec for the module. In fact, they actually point out that you could imagine a dictionary module with the property that uh, if you do a lot of reads of a certain kind, it'll decide to rebalance on one of those reads, in which case the read operation will be will now be a write from their point of view, even though it's yeah, still a funny assumption they're making. I mean, you could sort of imagine the intuition behind it, but you're absolutely right that maybe like a dictionary that optimizes itself based on the profile, which which operations are most likely to be looked up. Maybe, uh, maybe as a more realistic example, suppose we have a binary search tree that can search for ranges and it sees a bunch of queries for a particular range and they keep happening. Well, wouldn't it be great if we rebalance the tree so that range was at the very top, we could answer it right away. Well, that would be a cool tree data structure, but this read operation would indeed mutate stuff behind the scenes. And in some ways, this is like a contract that they are forcing on the data structure implementer and saying, well, you now have to satisfy this contract that reads are always thread safe, which might not be true. Uh, yeah. I think they're pretty precise about this, that, um, that I, was, I would say this is part of the interface to the library, uh, which I would qualify as part of the spec, right? The spec of this dictionary is 
if you use it in this way, like following these rules, then it behaves like a dictionary. Otherwise it does whatever it wants. Yes, of course that's true, but it's not the spec that you would expect. I think, I think it is what you'd expect, right? I don't well, think it's I think it's a, you'd expect a lookup operation to be a read. What do you and mean? in most I mean, implementations, it is a read. Oh, okay. So I, I would argue that you can't tell. Like the, the, the library has to tell you what are reads and what are writes. Yes, absolutely. I'm just pointing out that it might not be that obvious. And it yeah, I think they're relying can... on the documentation. I think the C sharp documentation is actually quite good about this, and that's why it's easy um, yeah, for fortunate. standard library classes. The other comment that's perhaps worth making is that the standard way to avoid these problems is for the implementation to take out a lock. And of course, there's good reasons why they don't want to do that, but, but it's worth pointing that out. Yeah, so C Sharp has a concurrent dictionary that is not in this list. Yeah, so I but think a concurrent dictionary doesn't need any checks. One sort of interesting observation about this paper is that if you wanted to avoid TSV invariant violations, you could mechanically make this true by putting a lock around every use of a TSV data structure that they mentioned in that file. I think this is basically what Butler is getting at, but. <laughs> that would avoid the invariant violations, might still have bugs in it, and probably would not have good performance. Right, locks are expensive, especially when you have lots of cores. Yeah. All right, so there's two things I wanted to sort of talk about in this context. One is to understand um, their sort of false positive story uh, a little bit better. Um, so they really make a big deal in this paper. They have no false positives. So um, I wanted to contrast their TSV invariant with this uh, data race freedom invariant that we considered on the previous board. So the data race invariant basically looks the same. You can almost make an analogy that, it's, well, the data structure is actually simple. The data structure is one memory location. And the operations can also be broken into read sets. You know, the read is in the read set. And writing to a memory location, well, that's in the write set. And I'm slightly oversimplifying this uh, picture, but not by much. I think this is roughly what um, the data race invariant uh, checkers look for, that if there's a memory location that you can uh, read and write from different threads, then the invariant is basically the same. Then there's nothing concurrent with a write operation. So same exact invariant, same exact setup. But actually what turns out to be the case is that these data race invariants have all kinds of false positives when you run them on real software. And yet the TSV invariant has no false positives if you believe this paper. So what's the deal? <laughs> why, why is it bad? Like the only difference is what the data structure is, memory locations. Almost seems like a simpler data structure. Any thoughts? Why, why do data races have many false positives and TSVs don't seem to? I guess it seems to me like uh, if what they did was use the techniques used for data race, uh, for finding data races, uh, to find the thread safety invariants, uh, which is to say just use this happens group relationship, they also would have had, I think, false positives. Uh, but because they're doing this uh, sort of more expensive thing of adding delays, they know that if they find a violation, it certainly is a violation. And it seems like you could also try doing that with uh, data races, which is like whenever there's a memory write, you perhaps pause and wait and see if there's another memory write that uh, gets triggered in some other thread. And then you call that a, a data race, and that's the only thing you report. Uh, so it just seems like it's the methodology that's Maybe. So I think you're basically saying that these guys have a separate dimension, uh, scheduling, for how they explore the, explore the schedule. And uh, that's certainly the case. We'll sort of get to that in a second. Um, but I think in terms of the invariant itself, um, there's other tools that also sort of basically apply this delay methodology to then see if you can hit a data race instead. And uh, sort of the complaints they had about happens before is that, well, maybe your happens before is not quite right. Um, uh, and uh, you're not precise enough uh, in your happens before tracking, which certainly I think that's a fair criticism from this paper of the happens before work. 
Um, but if you can actually actually trigger a concurrent uh, read and write of the same memory location, um, then I think one reason why uh, data races are not as good of an invariant for inferring bugs is that actually there's lots of benign data races. So for example, you might have some statistics counter in your software and you update it from multiple threads. And maybe you don't care if, uh, you know, with a small probability you lose some statistics counters uh, due to overwrites from multiple threads. Or maybe you have some statistics counter being maintained by one thread and other threads read the statistics counters at the same time. I mean, strictly speaking, that's a data race because you could have gotten a value of that statistics counter from before or after the writer thread updated it. It is a data race, but it's benign in the sense that the program isn't going to crash just because you had that data race. And it might actually be even the case that the behavior of the overall system is totally acceptable despite this data race happening there. And I think the contrast is that there's almost no benign TSD races. I think this is their insight here is that for a data structure like a dictionary, um, if you have a concurrent read and a write, there really is a possibility that you will throw some exception or crash or panic or who knows what will happen in C sharp or you know if you apply these ideas to a different environment. Uh, who knows what will happen if you have a data structure being mutated under the covers while you're also looking up in that same exact data structure. So I think the reason why they have so few false positives is that the fact that you raised on a data structure is a pretty strong indicator that you could indeed throw an exception or something else will go wrong. And maybe it doesn't go wrong in your particular case because you know you didn't resize the hash table or rebalance the tree at that instant. But it's pretty, I think, widely accepted by developers that yeah, you could have been doing a resize operation at any instant. And as a result, well, we should worry about it and it's worth fixing uh, that race. Whereas, you know, there's many situations where you report a data race and the software developer thinks, well, maybe that's actually totally fine. You know, I have non-deterministic result of this racing read, but so be it. Another closely related observation is that the hardware is provided, <laughs> providing you with atomicity for the memory read and write operations. And you can see this really clearly if you consider what happens, for example, if the, the read and write operation is for multiple words. Now it's much more dangerous. Absolutely, yeah. So actually, it's like well, one benefit is that actually this guy is atomic in hardware. So I think Butler is exactly right that, you know, if this was, um, for example, if our data structure was not a, you know, if it was a UN64, uh, most hardware these days makes atomic reads and writes of that location. But if we had a U128, like a 128-bit integer, most hardware implements it as two memory accesses or two words storing two 64-bit halves of this stuff. And then it's still a data race in the same sense, but now the results might be much crazier if you race because you'll and see. And this was in fact a, a big problem when people went um, from 32-bit to 64-bit floating point because a lot of code had been written on the assumption that accessing a floating point number was atomic. But when you went to 64-bit floating point on hardware that only did reads and only gave you 32-bit atomicity for reads and writes, it was no longer true that the access to the floating point number was atomic. And so you could pick up a floating point number that was in the middle of being written by another process, and it could be complete nonsense. This, this went by the name of word tearing. I think one useful thing to clarify here is what do we mean by a false positive? So we're looking, the, the ultimate goal is to find bugs in the software. And this paper defines a bug as a thread safety violation, which makes it very easy for the paper to claim that they have zero false positives. Because as Supermanu has pointed out, like they have observed an execution of the code in which there was a thread safety violation. But there's a more important question of are thread safety violations actually problematic? And 
indeed, like if you look at the documentation for the .NET API, it tells you that you are not allowed to concurrently read and write to a dictionary. Um, but even that is just what the software is claiming. That's like we're declaring it to be a bug to violate what this code is asking for. Um, but you know, in reality, you might know that given the implementation and given the way that I'm using it, no resizes are possible because I'm absolutely sure the dictionary is, has enough capacity. Um, so there may, no, there may not be a bug in the sense that there may be no possible execution on your hardware, which is buggy, but we're still violating the contract. And so we consider that a bug and worth fixing. Yep, exactly. So in some sense then, Tej, I think exactly answers the question of what would a false positive look like for uh, TSV. So I think it's basically a pair of maybe a read and a write that, uh, ha that you know, have no you know, crash or other you know, issue if they happen concurrently. Uh, so I was actually looking through this list of uh, APIs and uh, you know, one thing seemed uh, kind of interesting. So uh, at the bottom of this list, they have an uh, array list abstraction. So this is the thing shown here. And array list, as far as I understand, it's actually defined to be a contiguous array of elements in memory efficient for indexing. Um, so being able to set an item in an array list is a write API according to TSVD. So you're only allowed to set an item in an array if no other operations are going on. That sort of oddly excludes the possibility that you already have an array list of 10 elements and you're trying to concurrently set items one and five. And, uh, you know, if I was a developer using this API, I would think that's totally fine. And I would imagine the array list implementation under the covers, if I don't resize it or do anything else, should allow me to concurrently access multiple elements. But yet TSVD says that no, setting an array element is then set, is a write, and getting it is a read. So I can't concurrently set one element and get a different element or set multiple elements. So I think uh, you know it's possible to get a false positive in the broader sense of TSVD flagging an issue that developers wouldn't care about and that couldn't cause any bigger problems in the software. Um, but uh, Tej also makes a good point that the paper carefully defined that <laughs> their false positives are definitionally non-existent because bugs are what they find. I think it's useful also to go back to the Google static analysis papers definition of false positive, where they said, it's okay, it, like you have reported a real bug as long as a developer acted on it. I think that is actually an incredibly useful definition. Um, and when this thing reports that you're misusing the dictionary API and you fix it, I think like that's the success, even if you know, you're a hundred percent sure the dictionary implementation can't have a bug. They actually give some statistics which say that I think that developers acted on about 30% of all the bugs that they found. Yeah, I think they got, uh, they got acknowledgments for even more. Uh, they, 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 the developers they accepted that a little more than half of them really were bugs, but they actually only acted on 70% of those. Yeah. Still, it's not bad. Yeah, no, actually for all the things I'm sort of, you know, trying to poke holes at it, I think it's a very cool system that actually works surprisingly well uh, but, uh, you know, for the purposes of trying to understand it better, I'm, you know, trying to poke holes at it and trying to see what the limits are. Um, but it's cool that it works as well as it does. All right, so other questions on sort of the definition of a bug for them and why this seems to work well and when it might not. All right, so let's now uh, talk a little bit about their scheduling plan. And this is, uh, you know, the left side of this board here is what is a bug to them? And the right side is how do they get the software to trigger the bug? And the inside is basically what Upamanyu alluded to. Um, so he was trying to explain this as like a way, why, why do they have low false positives? And part of it is I think they're really trying to force the software to really hit this threat safety violation instead of showing, in, instead of arguing that, oh, you know, could have happened. And the idea is that you got some thread writing here and you do something like, I don't know, list.append maybe in your code. And they decide that, well, list.append is one of these TSV invariant things. We had an entry in that file that we were looking at a second ago for list.append. That's all right. So what we're going to do in uh, TSVD is we're actually going to inject a sleep statement in here. And they basically sleep for 100 milliseconds uh, whenever they hit 
a likely uh, you know, point where this invariant might be violated. And the reason the sleep is sort of cool is that um, now it's not actually just a sleep. There's actually something more here. We basically like register uh, what they call a trap, which describes the operation that this thread is about to run. So this thread is about to run list append with some specific arguments. So we're going to register it here. And then as other threads run along, maybe this list append actually now, because of the sleep, isn't happening for quite a while. So this is like the whole time this thread is sleeping. So now, if another thread does list.lookup, well, strictly speaking, we are not racing yet with the list append because the list append, because of the sleep, got moved down here. But we registered the trap. So the system, the TSVD system, knows that and this thread on the right is about to do a list append. So when it sees a thread on the left doing a list lookup during this sleep, it can pretty unambiguously conclude that these list lookup operations can race with the list append that's about to happen. And that's when they declare a TSV invariant violation, kind of like a data, you know, a very reliable form of a happens before checker, like really forces this execution to happen. Uh, in order to report a race on this uh, data structure. That's their sort of very simple plan um, for how to explore different scheduling uh, constraints or scheduling decisions. And they sort of, you know, force various threads to sleep to inflate the amount of time that a write is happening or a read is happening so that other threads have a higher chance of racing and triggering this bug or invariant violation. More precisely speaking, that makes sense. Questions about this? Uh, I guess one thing you mentioned was uh, they'll register the arguments for the function that you were calling uh, in the trap thing, and I guess what they seem to be precisely doing is only registering the object that you were calling the the member function of, or something like that. Yeah, uh, so I think they register the object and whether it's a read or a write, so that you know what operations are okay or not okay to erase. Yeah. Right, right. I guess in principle, you could also try like registering the arguments or something like that and maybe try to write an spec for like the array list thing you were talking about. Yeah, exactly. About. Yeah. So it was a array list thing I was complaining about five minutes ago. Yeah, they could have totally made this more fine grain and said, well, for array list, the rule is a little bit more tricky because reading and writing the same offset is bad, different offsets, that's okay. So they could have probably done this. And I imagine that if uh, they saw lots of people misusing array list according to their invariant, they probably would have gone and actually changed their tool. I imagine it's actually not, not too hard to change to make their invariant a little bit more precise and really capture what is and is not okay to do on a data structure concurrently. So this is sort of an example of what Butler was saying that these guys are reading into what this concurrency spec of a data structure is, might or might not be true in both directions. Maybe they're not tight enough, maybe they're too tight, um, but uh, I imagine if, if they had serious uh, numbers of problems or false reports due to this, they could probably go in and uh, you know make this more precise. It doesn't seem like they have a whole lot of APIs that they're dealing with. Like that, that file we were just looking at on the other screen on my computer, uh, you know, it's a couple of kilobytes long, not not unmanageable for someone to you know look at carefully and think about for a day and probably decide that's okay or not okay. All right, so the last part I want to talk about is sort of much of where the action is, I should say, in this paper is really on various optimization techniques. So I should actually say the sleep technique that these guys use actually showed up initially or showed up earlier in a paper called Data Collider uh, about 10 years ago, uh, also from a subset of the same authors. So uh, these guys have been very excited about the sleep technique for a while now. Um, Pretty effective also. So Data Collider didn't have as many of the fancy optimizations that we're about to talk about, uh, but certainly introduced this idea of delaying threads as a way to force races to happen. That seems like a good insight in general uh, to take away from this paper, a cool trick for surfacing concurrency bugs. All right, so let's now talk a little bit about the various optimizations that these guys uh, jump through. And the big question for them is basically when to inject the sleep or delay. And it's almost 
surprising how empirical they are in figuring out how to answer this question. There's very little analysis going on. It's all very heuristics and empirical measurements. Uh, so they have these basically two tricks that seem important. Um, uh, one is this idea of a near miss. And the uh, idea there is that uh, you've got two threads running along. Uh, one of them maybe is doing that insert that we were looking at before. And a different thread is running along and maybe doing a lookup here. And what they do is actually, while the threads are running, they're not injecting any delays yet. They're just monitoring what are the different threads doing. And they register all these guys into some kind of a global log. Uh, so when a, when a thread does an insert or a lookup or any of these other operations that they know about for the TSV, they register them in the log. And then they basically look at, you know, how far away are these guys from each other in absolute wall clock time? So basically the plan is if the delta is less than 100 milliseconds, then TSVD says, well, that actually seems pretty cool. They're actually within 100 milliseconds of each other. Maybe I could get them to race. Um, so then if they see that there's an insert and a lookup separated by a little bit of time, then they go ahead and actually inject um, a sleep into this insert. So very empirical. They look at threads. They see these two operations could have almost conflicted. So they insert a sleep for the first operation to try to see if it can uh, cause it to race with the second operation. And I guess in the nice uh, case, the picture looks like what I showed on the previous slide, the sleep uh, or this pattern they're hoping will occur again. So they're looking for tests that run sort of a bunch of stuff that keeps recurring. So if the workload does the same insert and lookup again, then this sleep will trigger and cause this thread to delay for a little while. And then when this lookup comes along, it'll notice that a sleep was or an insert was registered as a trap on the same object and ah, declare a TSV violation. So that's the happy path for them. That's this near miss idea is that they look for things that are close to hitting uh, a bug and they try to force the bug to hit by inserting a delay. Um, so this is actually one of the cool ideas in this paper. The previous work just blindly inserted sleeps everywhere just for the heck of it. And actually, even that was surprisingly effective. But their idea is to actually be a little bit more intentional about choosing when to inject the sleep. And this actually works pretty well. And the other um, sort of very empirical thing they do is they have this inference uh, of happens before relationships. So the way this works for them is, again, the same picture. Uh, we have an insert over here, and we also have a lookup happening later. And this is a situation where the insert and the lookup were within, you know, maybe 100 milliseconds of each other. So we decided to actually inject a sleep here. So the question you might have is, the, well, isn't this going to be a waste of time for the most part? Because most software is actually written well. So probably what that means is that the programmer is holding a lock around the insert. And he's going to try to hold the same lock around the lookup. So if we insert a sleep here, that's not going to help. We're going to delay the insert. That's just going to cause the lookup to happen later. So this is exactly the thing that they actually look for uh, as a way to detect that these operations are properly synchronized. So in, in, in happens before terminology, what this means is that actually there is a relationship between this insert and lookup, namely that this insert is probably followed by an unlock and there's a lock before the lookup and what and the unlock must happen before the lock can run so if you delay this thread on the left then the thread on the right will necessarily also delay so what they do is they inject the sleep here and they see what happens and if they see the lookup moves down and happens later they say well probably this stuff is actually correct it's not worth trying to inject a sleep anymore so what they do is they, when they inject one of these 100 millisecond sleeps before an operation, they then measure this delta T by how much did the other operation, like the lookup, happen later as a result of us injecting this 100 milliseconds. So if this delta T is also approximately 100 milliseconds, then they declare this to be not actually a bug. There's probably some synchronization. The sort of amusing thing is they actually have no idea what the synchronization is. All they observe is that we delayed one, the other got delayed as well. 
And they use that as an inference signal to indicate that, yeah, there's probably enough synchronization. And very simple and also seemingly pretty effective for them. Uh, so these are the sort of the main tricks that the, they play for answering this question of when to actually inject the sleep into their code, into the program they're analyzing. Um, the results uh, you guys probably saw in the paper are actually surprisingly effective. So they're pretty effective at finding bugs. And maybe the most impressive part for me is the low effort. You just take a C-sharp program and you run this tool and it finds concurrency bugs. That's probably the most impressive thing about this tool is that it's effective at finding bugs with very little developer effort and relatively low, or I guess, low false positives by their definition. Um, so it's a pretty cool tool. Hopefully it gave you some introduction to uh, concurrency bug finding and why it's tricky and what hoops people jump through to try to uh, make this work in practice. Any questions about this paper? Now that we've talked about most of the pieces here. All right, so that's it for this lecture on testing for concurrency bugs. Uh, next week is a weird schedule because there's a holiday and then we have a recitation uh, focused on lab three on next Thursday. But then the week after that, we're gonna jump into a more formal treatment of concurrency to try to figure out how do we statically prove that there are no concurrency bugs and reason about them um, without having to try to enumerate all possible schedules. All right, that's it. See you guys uh, next week.